Okay, hello, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about security as risk management. What does that mean? Well, uh, in the last lecture I talked about why security is difficult. And so if you can't attain perfect security, how do you deal with that situation? Do you just throw up your hands and say, well, security's no good because I can't have it? Well, uh, no, <laughs> that would be a hopeless situation. But um, two guys, Viega and McGraw, who wrote a very nice book called Building Secure Software, um, made the claim, and I agree with them, that system and software security is really all about managing risk. What does that mean? Well, risk is the possibility that something bad will happen. In particular, here's a definition the possibility that a particular threat will adversely affect an information system by exploiting a particular vulnerability. Well, uh, if, if that's what security is about, then how do you figure out what the risks are for your particular system and how do you deal with them? And in particular, you've got to take into account, you know, if something bad happens, what are the potential consequences of that? Okay. So, Viega and McGraw came up with a particular, particular set of tools or a particular set of steps for dealing with risk. And you can find risk management frameworks in a lot of different books, but this is, a, this is one that seems to me to make a lot of sense. Uh, what do you do first? Well, you assess what the risks are, excuse me, you assess what the assets are in your system. That is, what's at risk? Um, is it software? Is it hardware? Is it uh, data? And often it will be all of those. You figure out what the threats are, what potentially bad things could happen with respect to that collection of assets. You figure out what the vulnerabilities are, that is, what flaws in your security system might allow those threats to be manifest. Um, once you've done the first three steps, then you can figure out what the risks are to your system. And once you do that, you can start figuring out what to do about them and making uh, decisions about how to, uh, which risks need to be mitigated or taken care of and which you know you can you can live with and uh, and and what what do those management decisions look like well typically there are four things which you can do with any risk right you can either accept it um, you know meaning that there's nothing you can do about that risk or or the cost of doing something about it is too high so imagine driving right Every time you drive on the streets, there's always a risk that you'll have an accident. And yet, you accept that risk because the alternative is stay at home and not do certain things that you want to do, right? And so that's a risk that you accept. On the other hand, you do want to be careful. And so the second way you might deal with risk is risk avoidance. Uh, risk avoidance means not do something that, that might increase your risk, right? So what's an example of that when you're driving? Well, maybe you don't drive on highways, or maybe you don't drive at night, you know, that's, those are rules that some elderly people follow, right? And the point of that is to avoid certain risks uh, and, and yet maintain their possibility of driving. Risk mitigation is about reducing the possibility that there will be serious consequences if a risk does occur or if a threat does manifest itself. Um, and so for driving, for example, you might decide to drive your old Chevy instead of your Bentley. Right? Because you know if you're in a, a, an accident there, it's going to cost you less to get it fixed. And then finally, risk transfer means you're taking the risk and handing it off to somebody else. And so when you buy an insurance policy, that's what you're doing is risk transfer. And uh, a home security system is another one. Right? So you install a home security system and then you put a, a placard in your front yard that says you have a home security system. And what that does is it sort of transfers the risk to your neighbor who doesn't have a home security system because somebody coming along who's going to break into the, the house is going to say, well, I'm going to skip this guy's house and I'm going to go over here instead. Right. So if those are the possibilities, right, how might you go about uh, figuring out what the risk is for your particular scenario? So imagine this case where you're a bank and uh, you identify that there are four potential risks right, listed here. And uh, so SWIFT, SWIFT fraud, SWIFT is that organization which allows movement of very large quantities of money from one bank to another by wire transfer. And these others you know, so, are sort of obvious, right? So what you might do is use this thing called an annualized loss expectancy where you write down what all your risks are 
you write down the potential downside of that risk being actualized, that is the amount of money you might lose, and then you figure out what the possibility or the probability is that that risk will actually occur. So if you look at this one, for example, uh, the incidence is fairly low, which, meaning, which means that this happens only about once every 200 years, right? Uh, this one occurs, you know, maybe every, f every five years, this every two years, and this one you know, 200 times a year, right? And so if you do the math then, you get this actualized loss ex expectancy. Uh, and the idea then is that you're supposed to look at those numbers and say, well, clearly where I should spend my, my security money is here because that's where, the, that's where the maximum loss might occur, right? And that's a pretty good idea, but it's also a fairly naive idea, right? Because really what you're doing in this methodology is you're computing the expected value of your security expenditures. That is, you're saying, what, um, you know, given the, given the possible things that might happen, can I put a dollar value on the likelihood that they will happen? And that's not a bad idea. But there are psychological factors which probably should come into effect, right? So if we go back to this chart, notice this one, even though it's very unlikely, if it actually occurs, is liable to drive you out of business, right? Because it's going to cost you $50 million. And maybe your bank can't sustain that sort of a loss. And so, you know, even though this has a much lower probability of happening, maybe you still want to put some effort into making sure that it doesn't happen, right? So uh, looking, at, looking at loss in this, in this way of expected value, right, a, a way to think about that is consider these two scenarios. You know, I give you a dollar. Who could complain about that? That's great. Uh, and the other possibility is we flip a coin and heads, I give you $1,000, but tails, you owe me $998. Well, if you compute the expected value in both cases, it's still a dollar, right? But it doesn't feel like the risks are the same in the two cases, right? In the first case, there's really not much risk. But in the second case, you know, you have the possibility of being out $998. And so, uh, you know, there's got to be more to, to assessing risk than just this expected value way of looking at things. So what have, we, uh, what have we learned in this lesson, right? Because security is, is, perfect security is really impossible, you know, realistic security has to be about managing risk. And there are some systematic techniques like this uh, uh, annualized loss expectancy for dealing with risks and, and, and writing numbers down on a sheet of paper. But while assessing risk is important, it's also quite difficult in realistic situations. And there are lots of factors which may come into play. For example, you know, technical factors, economic factors, uh, psychological factors. And so uh, assessing risk is a, subtle, is a subtle thing, but probably a good thing to do. Thank you.